Well, good afternoon. I'm going to repeat what my uh, fellow awardees said, but I, it's a great honor for me to be up here and especially to talk about my research in front of such a prestigious audience. Um, I'm going to talk about the value of dispersants for offshore oil spill response, and I'm expanding the scope of my talk a little bit based on what you saw in the, in the program, but I am going to talk about the use of dispersants during the Deepwater Horizon incident. And if I could subtitle that portion of my talk, it will be the glass is half full. Um, I think we heard, we've heard stories about the glass being half empty and it's continuing to empty, but I, I, I think I'm going to show you some evidence that the glass, the Gulf of Mexico glass is half full. And maybe now that we're over two and a half years post uh, spill from 2010, uh, the glass is actually filling up quite nicely. So I'm going to start my talk with an outlook on the energy industry by sharing some of ExxonMobil's predictions for energy growth over the next 30 years. We forecast global energy demand to increase by 35 uh, percent by the year 2040. And this is mainly by growth in developing nations. Oil will remain the number one fuel, but natural gas will overtake coal for the number two spot. To support this growth, obviously, the world will have to expand its energy supplies. And it's important for us to do this in a safe, affordable, and environmentally responsible manner. I think the reason I'm standing here today is because ExxonMobil has made long-term investments in technology to protect the environment. One way this is reflected is with over 40 years of oil spill response research. It's the long-term continuity of that research that allowed us to be ready during the Deepwater Horizon spill with an idea that I'll describe later in the talk, but an idea that I think uh, uh, significantly mitigated the impacts uh, from the spill. I want to point out that although ExxonMobil investment in oil spill response research has been significant, it really pales in, in comparison to the investment that we put into operations integrity. That is, the technology the personnel, the equipment, the training that goes into keeping oil spills from happening in the first place. So this slide just summarizes what I'm going to talk about today, but for me to describe to you why dispersants are really a critical tool, and what we're talking about is large offshore spills, but why it's a critical tool, I have to stock, talk about the other response options that we have for offshore oil, oil spills, and, so you, and describe to you some of the challenges of those options. I'll, in, in the middle of my talk, I'll talk about dispersants and give you some information about what dispersants are and how they work. And then I'll end up by talking specifically about the use of subsea dispersant injection during the Deepwater Horizon incident in 2010. So this slide shows what we call the oil spill response toolbox, and it shows really the three primary tools, the active tools we have for offshore oil spills, and that is mechanical recovery, which uses booms and skimmers. Uh, we have in situ burning, which also requires booms. And then I show dispersants at the bottom of this slide, and I've broken that up into two categories because we have the traditional way of using dispersants, which is aerial application. But then the novel tool that was used during the Deepwater Horizon incident is subsea injection of dispersants, and I'll talk about that. If we go back and look at the history of oil spills and we look at mechanical recovery, we find out that only between 5 and maybe at the most 15 percent of any oil that's ever been spilled offshore has ever been recovered mechanically. And the challenge with mechanical recovery, as I'll describe on the next two slides, is the challenge of the physics of keeping oil contained in booms. The Deepwater Horizon incident was no different, and oil, the amount of oil that was recovered during the Deepwater Horizon spill was actually only 3 percent. In situ burning is an important oil spill response tool and industry has been researching it for decades, but it's interesting to note that it's only been an operational tool one time and that's during the Deepwater Horizon incident. The reason that's the case is because in situ burning requires fire resistant booms and these tend to be large bulky pieces of equipment. And for traditional spills which are a one time release, by the time those pieces of equipment can be pulled from their stockpile and out to the spill site, the oil has spread so thin and moved off in different directions that in situ burning really isn't practical. The Deepwater Horizon spill was different because the oil was continuously coming up to the surface for, for many weeks and that allowed forces to be garnered and in situ burning was used uh, quite successfully during the Deepwater Horizon incident. But even so, the estimates are that only between 5 and 7 percent of the, of the oil was, was burned um, during that spill and again, it's because of the challenges of using booms offshore. 
And the rest of my talk, I'll, uh, or the bulk of my talk, I'll talk about dispersants. So the next couple of slides, I'm going to try, try to describe the challenges that we have with offshore oil spill response. And this slide illustrates an important component of an important reason we're challenged, and that's the encounter rate. Now, encounter rate is the ability of a response tool to treat an oil slick over time. And this graphic is one of the best ones I've, we've, we've developed to show the challenges of encounter rate for, for mechanical recovery. If you look at the vessel that's in the middle of the slick right there, that vessel is a, is a work boat that's moving quite quickly through that slick because you can still see its wake. But if you envision that vessel as being a, a large offshore skimming vessel, the swath width of the booms of that vessel would be about twice the width of the wake. Okay? Now that vessel is probably moving at 8 to 10 knots across that slick because you can still see the wake. But if it was trying to contain oil in a boom, it would have to move at less than one knot. That's simply because any faster speed in the, and you just physically start to lose entrainment of the oil, it sloshes over or under, under the boom. So it would be moving quite slowly. That slick we estimate to be three to five kilometers across or maybe even, even, lo even uh, wider because it goes off the frame of the photograph. If that vessel is moving at, at less than one knot, we estimate that it would take three to four hours to move across that slick one time. And on a good day, it might be able to turn around and make another pass across the slick and it would be really a phenomenal day for 12 hours of operation for it to make a third pass. But let's say it did make three passes across that slick, it would be an insignificant amount of that single uh, large oil slick. In contrast, a single C-130 plane, which is the largest platform we have for delivering dispersants, can treat that entire slick in one eight-hour operational period. So the encounter rate for dispersants by the largest platform we have is at least an order of magnitude greater than mechanical. Uh, than mechanical recovery. And the reason is we can fly in planes and use dispersants and we have to do all other oil spill response options from boats. But so you, you listen to that and you might think, well, all we need to do is have 10 or, as hun or 100 times as much mechanical recovery equipment and we can do something important to a slick like that. But unfortunately, it's really not that simple. And with this slide, I try to show why, but spill conditions limit our response options. And on this graph, I show wave height on the y-axis going from 0 to 18 feet. And on the x-axis, I show the slick thickness. And those are two important parameters that govern the efficiency of all oil spill response option. And for those two parameters, I'm trying to show the uh, windows of opportunity for all three response options that I mentioned, mechanical recovery, in situ burning with the red icons, and then the drop, green droplets are dispersants. As we start going up in wave height, and we start getting to seas that are much greater than three feet, we start to lose efficiency, especially in choppy seas, uh, with mechanical recovery and in situ burning. And again, it's because of the challenge of containing oil in booms. The oil simply gets washed over the top of these booms offshore. And certainly as we go up to four to six feet and five to seven feet, it's going to be extremely challenging to contain oil in booms and carry out either in situ burning or mechanical recovery. Dispersants don't have that problem. In fact, dispersants work better with the more mixing ener that you, the energy that you have because you can form a finer dispersion with more mixing energy. I show an upper limit in this graph of 10 feet because that might be a, a wave height where it would be unsafe to put personnel out on a, on a spill, either in boats to spray dispersants or even in airplanes. But fortunately, for a light oil like the Maconda oil that was spilled in 2010, Mother Nature will take over. And if you have enough, enough mixing energy, you can get natural dispersion, which really is the same, basically the same thing as, uh, as using dispersants. So as waves get over 10 feet, for certain types of oil, especially light, low viscosity oils, you can get natural dispersion to happen. If we look at slick thickness, we've defined a limit for uh, where efficiency starts to drop off, I should say, at about three-tenths of a millimeter on this graph for mechanical recovery and in situ burning. And the reason that is the case is because you have a, a swath width of these booms. The thinner the oil is, the less, the thinner the oil slick is, the less, less oil that's moving into those booms, and you're just not collecting much oil. And as you get much less than three-tenths of a millimeter, you start to become really inefficient because you're just not collecting much oil in these booms. I think that's one of the reasons, the slick thickness is one of the reasons that, dis, that uh, mechanical recovery wasn't more effective during the Deepwater Horizon spill in 2010 because that was an extremely low viscosity oil. And when it came up to the surface, it immediately spread out to what we estimate to be average thicknesses that were on the order of a tenth of a millimeter. 
and that's well below the, the range where we think mechanical recovery can be efficient. Dispersants don't have the same problem. They can treat oils that are much less than a tenth of a millimeter thick and still, and still be effective. So it's the combination of these spill conditions that limit our, our response options and the encounter rate issue that I showed on the, pr on the previous slide that industry and oil spill responders have known about for a long uh, period of time and have resulted in the development of technologies like, like dispersants. So we can't simply just add 10 or 100 times as much equipment to do, to do the job under a lot of, different, a lot of prevailing sea uh, conditions. So at this slide, I'll describe dispersants. I'll describe what they are and how they work a little bit. But dispersants of solu are solutions of surfactants dissolved in a solvent. Now the surfactants are the active ingredient in dispersants. And they're compounds with unique kind of chemical character. But those surfactants that are in dispersants are very similar to the surfactants that we would have in shampoos or soaps. And they may actually be the same, the same compounds that are used in some of these household products. But the idea and the reason we put dis dispersants on an oil slick is to reduce the interfacial tension between the oil and the water. So you spray dispersants on an oil slick or you inject dispersants into a plume of oil coming out of the well. And the surfactants extremely quickly align themselves at the interface between the oil and the water. And what they do is they reduce the interfacial tension. That allows the slick or the oil to break up into millions of tiny droplets. And the, for a good dispersion, the droplets are going to be, have a diameter on the order of 50 microns. And that's just for perspective, that's about the thickness of an average uh, human hair. And those droplets are so small that their rise velocity is really becomes kind of insignificant compared to the amount of turbulence available in the ocean. So those droplets stay in the water column for uh, basically indefinitely because they become food sources, as we heard this morning, food, a food source for um, biodegradation. Um, the third bullet here is an important bullet, and a lot, of, a lot of researchers don't understand this, but dispersed oil plumes rapidly dilute, whether it's an oil plume formed at the surface or an oil plume formed subsea. And we know based on a lot of data, a lot of measurements taken during real spills and data collected in, in wave basins where we study dispersants, that a dispersed oil plume is going to dilute to concentrations on the order of 10 parts per million within minutes after it's formed and maybe even maximum concentrations on the, are on the order of 10 parts per million. The dilution continues and within the period of a few hours, a dispersed oil plume in maybe less than a day, a dispersed oil plume is going to be on the concentration of one part per million. Certainly average concentrations are going to be on one part per million and maybe even maximum concentrations are going to be on the order of one part per million. And just to put some perspective on that, if you look at your bottle of drinking water that some of us have on our table here, if you took a sample of oil or water that had one part per million dispersant in it, it would look about as clear as the drinking water on your table. So it's a little disturbing when I see some of these conceptual images of the dispersed oil plume that was emanating from the, uh, from the Deepwater Horizon incident, and you see this brown mass that's moving 40 or 50 kilometers away from the, from the discharge point. That oil is a plume only in the scientific sense of a plume in that it's a uh, concentration of oil in that plume is above background. But the reality is I think most people's perception of what a plume is a black boiling cloud that's moving down. The reality is during the Deepwater Horizon incident, and there were hundreds if not thousands of samples taken as close to the well site as they could get, but between 500 and 1,000 kilometers, and almost all of those samples were below one part per million. So the dispersed oil plumes rapidly dilute even in deep water. Dilution continues and within the period of a day or two the dispersed oil concentrations are going to drop below one part per million and that's another important number uh, to understand because that concentration is the concentration at which biodegradation starts to happen. We know based on evidence from lab testing that it takes approximately one to two days for a dispersed oil droplet to be colonized by petroleum degrading microorganisms and that's when the biodegradation process ramps up. And because those concentrations are so low, there's not enough hydrocarbons at any location in the environment for all of the available oxygen or the available nutrients to be exhausted. And I, we heard Robert Haddad mention that this morning, but there were again thousands of samples collected during the Deepwater Horizon incident where more oil and more dispersant maybe has ever been used. And there was really no evidence of hypoxia in the Gulf of Mexico, and that was really a big concern during the event. 
We didn't expect hypoxia to happen because of what we know about how rapidly uh, dispersed oil dilutes, but it's that, it's that dilution that allows it to happen. One part per million, I forgot to mention, but one part per million is another important uh, concentration to remember because that's the concentration. Most acute toxicity thresholds for marine organisms are greater than one part per million. And I believe that's why there's never been evidence from a uh, use of dispersants in the field of a significant fish kill. It's simply because within a period of a few hours, the concentration of the dispersed oil is diluting below these acute toxicity thresholds. And these are acute toxicity thresholds that are, that are, uh, that are uh, determined based on constant exposure to, to certain organisms for at least 48 to 96 hours. And we're diluting below those concentrations within a few, within a few hours. So each dispersed oil droplet, as I mentioned, is a concentrated food source for petroleum-degrading microorganisms. Um, and what dispersants do is they allow those organisms to do their job as efficiently as possible. Now, petroleum-degrading microorganisms exist in all environments that have been diligently searched. They are in the Arctic. We had a question this morning about using dispersants in the Arctic, and I would recommend that they should be on the table for oil spills in the Arctic. We've done studies of dispersant biodegradation under Arctic conditions. Petroleum degrading microorganisms exist in the Arctic, they exist in the Antarctic, they exist at the surface of the Gulf of Mexico, and they exist 5,000 feet down and deeper in the Gulf of Mexico. In fact, if you went out into the parking lot of the Western Galleria after a storm and you collected a sample of water in a puddle and cultured it, you would find petroleum degrading microorganisms. They are everywhere. So a little bit more information about dispersants. But ExxonMobil developed the primary dispersant that was used during the Deepwater Horizon incident, and that's Corex at 9500. And that product was developed in the mid-90s, but it was developed from a list of ingredients that the U.S. Food and Drug Administra Administration had, had allow allows for either human contact or human consumption. Now, I won't list the ingredients, but I would bet there is a lot of common household products that are made with ingredients that are found in Corex at 9500. And I would bet everyone in this audience has one or more, if not all of those ingredients somewhere in their house, either in their refrigerator, in their medicine cabinet, or in, under their kitchen sinks. The table at the bottom of this slide is, is another bit of interesting information, but in the mid-90s, Environment Canada did a study of the toxicity of, of Corex at 9500, and they compared it to some common household cleaners that you see there. I think most of us might be familiar with palm olive and sunlight dish soap. And they did tests where they exposed juvenile rainbow trout for 96 hours to various concentrations of these, of these different uh, products. And they studied, and their, their measurement was the lethal concentration that killed 50% of those organisms. And just for reference, le that lethal concentration, the lower that concentration is, the more toxic something is. So the bottom line from those tests is Corex at 9500 was found to be 27 times less toxic than common dish soaps at least the formulations that were available back in the mid-90s. So people have asked me before if I would, uh, if I would ever drink, you know, I talk about how low the toxicity of Corex at 9500 is. Would I ever drink Corex at 9500? I wouldn't drink Corex at 9500. But if somebody put a gun, if somebody put a gun to my head and said, you have to either drink palm olive dish soap or Corex at 9500, I would choose Corex at 9500 based on this, based on this kind of evidence. So the rest of my talk, I'll talk about dispersant use during the Deepwater Horizon incident. And what I'm going to talk about mainly is one of the reasons I believe I won the, the TAMIS Award for Technology Innovation, and that is I, I initiated the idea during the Deepwater Horizon incident for the use of subsea dispersant. So early in the spill, the response team for the Deepwater Horizon incident reached out to industry for ideas on how to deal with it. My management came to me very early in the spill and asked me for my recommendations because I'd been leading the, uh, the ExxonMobil oil spill response research program. Our research program had looked into the issue of how to deal with oil coming from a deep water blowout, and so we were ready. And the idea that I knew would have the most impact on this spill was to apply dispersants at the seabed, at the concentrated source of the oil coming out of the well. As I described earlier in the talk, I think dispersants are the best option in many cases to deal with large offshore oil spill because of the limitations of other, other response tools. The Deepwater Horizon incident was different than most spills, however, because of the continuous nature of that release and the fact that it was coming up from a deep environment, a deep water environment. 
So for this event, it just made sense to inject aspersants into the oil at the source, rather than waiting for that oil to come up in 5,000 feet of water. Because when it would come up, it would surface in potentially unknown locations day and night, and that oil, I mentioned before, it was extremely low in viscosity, so it would come up and be, immediately be very thin and make, a fit, make it very challenging to do other uh, response options. Conditions at the wellhead were ideal for dispersion because of the huge amount of uh, turbulent mixing energy from the energy of the oil coming out of that well. And also, dispersants work better on fresh oil. So the dispersion, and that's, that oil is at its freshest state when it's coming out of the wellhead. The other thing I'd mention is probably the Maconda oil that was coming out of that well was the most dispersible oil that had ever had a dispersants applied to it for one reason, because of its fresh nature when it was coming out of that, when it was coming out of the well. So our prior research into this, into that concept itself and dispersants in general made me quite confident that what is going to be successful, um, but there were many skeptics uh, during the spill. But our observations during, made during the spill, and I'll show you why on a couple of slides after this, but we believe it was extremely uh, successful and it did what we expected it to do. But there are some important benefits to subsea injection of dispersants for this kind of event. Now, they're going to only be used for this kind of event where oil is coming out from a source continuously. But one of the things we actually didn't think about when we were doing the research on this several years ago, but there's a safety aspect to subsea injection of dispersant. I'll show you on the next slide why it's the case in more detail. But fresh, volatile oil coming up from the seabed can come up right around the well site. And at the well site is where there were response vessels trying to control and contain the well. And those people, those, the personnel on those vessels uh, had the potential of being inundated by volatile organic compounds. In fact, I understand from talking to those responders that when subsea injection of dispersant wasn't being applied during the spill, the responders had to wear respirators to do their job when they're out on the decks of those vessels. And you can just imagine being in the Gulf of Mexico in the middle of the summer with 90 plus degree temperatures how that might impact uh, the abil your ability to do, to do your job if you have to walk around with, res with uh, respirators. Subsea disperse injection is, is much more efficient. The rule of thumb for applying dispersants at the surface is you need one part dispersant to 20 parts oil. We believe with subsea injection we can do one part dispersant to 100 parts oil, so we can use much less dispersant to do the same job. That's because of the large amount of mixing energy that's available, the concentrated source, and the fresh nature of, of the oil coming out of the well. And the third benefit here is the continuous operation of the tool, which is different than all other response tools. So response options that we have at the surface, you have to shut down because of lack of visibility, and unfortunately that happens every night. So all other response options have to shut down because of darkness. In a mile deep water, you have to take your lights with you, and they have no idea whether it's day or night. So those operations can proceed 24-7. Um, we've also looked at the long-term fate and effects um, of subsea dispersant injection, and, and our opinion now is that it will be the same, and there's evidence from the spill of, as the fate of dispersants, of a dispersed oil plume uh, from surface application of dispersants, because I mentioned these petroleum-degrading microorganisms exist everywhere. Dispersed oil plumes in deep water rapidly dilute, and there's much evidence from the spill that those organisms rapidly colonize and biodegraded the dispersed oil plumes even in deep water. So the next three slides I have are some aerial photographs that were taken during the, during the spill in 2010. These photographs were taken directly over, at about 10,000 feet, directly over the well site. And these vessels, uh, these vessels right here are probably directly over the well site trying to contain the well. But you can see that's a fresh oil slick that's coming up to the surface. And you just imagine there's a potential for volatile organic compounds coming, out, coming off of that oil. The response teams for the Deepwater Horizon event required, 24, required several 24-hour tests of subsea dispersant injection before they would approve it for, as an operational tool. And one of those tests was done on May 10th. And so this photograph was, was taken on May 9th, so it was before subsea dispersant injection was implemented. But on May 10th, this photograph was taken 11 hours, and it's over the same location. You can see the same vessels here. Um, it's taken over the same location. And our estimates are that there's 90% less oil on the surface. 
We looked at the winds and currents that were in place between May 9th and May 10th, and they didn't change significantly enough to uh, cause the change in the surface expression of the oil. We also talked to the photographer who took this photograph, and his job was to go out to the well site every day and take these types of photographs. And on May 10th, when he was flying out, his comments to me was that the entire region had much less oil on it. So he thought that the well had been capped. He didn't know what was going on operationally on the spill, but he thought the well had been capped because there was so much less, less oil on the surface. On May 11th, subsea injection of dispersants stopped early in the morning, and this photograph was taken five hours later. And we know that when you're not using dispersants, the size droplets that will be emanating from a well require about three or four hours to come up to the surface. And this slick came up to the surface after five hours. Um, and, and the only difference between this and the prior, prior day, in my opinion, is the, is the uh, injection of dispersants. Because certainly there were observations of the oil coming out of the well and the rate of that oil, uh, I don't believe, significantly changed over this time period. On May 12th, we also, there's some, also some aerial photographs, and there was even more oil on the surface on May 12th. Just for your information, uh, subsea dispersed injection became an operational tool after looking at this evidence on May 15th, and it was continued from then until the, uh, until the end of the spill, unless there was some operational reason for shutting it down. So what I showed you there was some qualitative evidence. The Deepwater Horizon incident wasn't a controlled experiment. Industry has, is in the process of doing controlled experiments to study subsea dispersion injection. I don't have time to talk about the details of that research. I'll just tell you that the preliminary results we have now do, do indicate that subsea injection dispersions work and it was the right idea. But we do have evidence from the Gulf of Mexico that shows that the glass isn't half empty, but it maybe it's half full or even fuller. This graph here is some, is some data that's collected every year by the National Oceanic and Atmos Atmospheric Administration. So every year they go around to various regions in the United States and collect commercial fishery catch data. And this graph shows the data that they've collected since 2000 for the Gulf of Mexico. And 2011 is the latest year that data is available. But in 2011, the commercial fish catch in the Gulf of Mexico was greater than any year except going all the way back to the year 2000. And I think that's quite surprising to a, to a lot of people because if you were listening to the media during the spill, uh, I think you would have come away believing that the Gulf of Mexico is going to be impacted and the fisheries maybe are going to be decimated for years. But that's just not what happened. Um, certainly there were impacts from the use of dispersants and the oil spill, but in my opinion those impacts were overshadowed by the benefits of having a six-month moratorium on fishing. And there were huge regions, and maybe most of the Gulf of Mexico, there were significant time periods where the commercial fishermen and the recreational fishermen could not go out and fish. And the benefits of re ending that fishing pressure on the Gulf of Mexico, I think, outweighed uh, the impacts uh, from, the, from the spill. Now, this is data from two years down the road. We heard Bob Haddad this morning. There, certainly, we need to keep our eye on this and look for the longer term I impacts, maybe to the bluefin tuna. I think the evidence and the how we know how dispersants work and they biodegrade and dilute, I think it's unlikely that those impacts are going to be significant, but certainly we have to keep looking. This is my second to the last slide, but this is what I call my senior management slide. I give this kind of talk quite frequently, but if there's one thing I like an audience like this to remember, but dispersants is that dispersants are a tool to enhance removal of oil from the environment by enhancing the process of biodegradation. I've been accused of promoting the out of sight, out of mind oil spill response option, and that's just not the case. Dispersants rapidly Allow, allow rapid biodegradation of the oil and maybe, and for many situations, especially large offshore spills, they are the best approach to removing oil from the environment. So I'll just summarize uh, a couple of points here, but certainly we believe the dispersant use presents a necessary trade-off given the limitations of mechanical recovery and should be a primary response option for, for offshore oil spills at least. Uh, that's in both the Gulf of Mexico and in the, in the Arctic as, as industry, industry potentially starts moving further and further into the Arctic. Subsea dispersant injection is a step change advance in our ability to respond to a well control incident. And it may have reduced the spill impacts from the Deepwater Horizon incident by an order of magnitude, in my opinion. Industry has included this tool uh, in oil spill contingency plans for drilling operations worldwide. 
So I'll just finish up by saying I think all we, one of our messages is that all oil spill response options need to be on the table for all oils. We shouldn't pre-restrict dispersants for oil spills. For large offshore spills, dispersants both subsea and in the air are, are often the only tool that can rapidly treat large amounts of oils to minimize the environmental impacts. So with that, I'll finish up and uh, hopefully we have time for some questions, but I thank you for your attention. Uh, you didn't mention many characteristics of the surfactant. Uh, from what I had read, I thought aerosol AOT, the dioctyl sodium sulfonate, so, <coughs> sulfosuccinate salt was used. Uh, that creates micro emulsions. Is that what happened here? Well, it can creates a dis uh, you know an oil and water dispersion. Okay, and 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 dioctyl sulfosuccinate was is one of the surfactants used in Core Exit 9500. You're correct, but it's used with three other surfactants, and it actually works in synergy with those other surfactants. So maybe the way it works by itself is a little bit different than how it would work in this in this type of environment. But what it does is it helps form these 50 micron droplets to form a, an oil and water um, dispersion. Are they transparent? Are the surfactants transparent? No, I mean the emulsion after you form it, is it transparent? Well, as I said, it's not, it's not transparent immediately because it's going to be at a significant concentration. But if you look at beakers of dispersed oil at various concentrations and say you start out at 100 parts per million, you go down to 10 parts per million, and you go down to one part per million or less, at one part per million, a dispersed oil plume, a scientific plume, is going to look the same as that bottle of water on the table no, right I, I know that. It's one of the characteristics of the AOT material. It's very unusual as a surfactant. But if it disperses like that, that means that the marine wildlife would be eating it in that form, too. The surfactants used in Corex at 9500 are all biodegradable, right? This, mm -hmm. The bottom line is use of dispersants is a trade-off, right? I, I wish we had a better tool. I wish we had magic dust that we could spill onto the, put onto the oil and make the oil disappear, but that's just not the case. What I try to describe is mechanical recovery is extremely challenged. Mm -hmm. What people need to understand is regardless of what we do for a large offshore spill, the oil is going into the environment in one way or another. Our mm -hmm. goal as responders is to put the oil in the environment in a form that is going to cause the least impact and allow the most rapid recovery. Mm -hmm. And in my opinion, and based on a lot of evidence, dispersants are going to allow that to happen. No, I, I'm not disagreeing with you. I agree. Yeah. It's a good idea. We'll let somebody okay. else have a yeah, I had a question about dealing with the logistics uh, providing enough dispersant to deal with such a huge uh, event. Yeah. So. The, the supplier of Corex and 9500 is Nalco, right? And they have a plant in Sugar Land in Texas, just outside of Houston. And they really did an, uh, an amazing effort to bring their facilities up to speed to manufacture enough dispersant for this spill. And it was really phenomenal because there was no guarantees that they could do that. We talked, we had, the industry had plans for this type of event, you know, which is opposite of what you may have heard. And one of those is to get, go to a, a company like Nalco to have them know, upgrade their capacity and start ramping up their ability to make dispersants because this kind of event, the stockpiles of dispersants that are available can be rapidly, rapidly consumed. And so NALCO did really a phenomenal job of, of, of coming up to speed and allowing uh, the dispersant supply chain not to be a limiting factor during the spill. So it seems that uh, the fact that you would have a, a huge influx of oil metabolizing bacteria um, could impact the overall microbial ecology of the ocean in that area, which could have, uh, you know, a huge environmental impact independent of the oil spill. And I wondered if anybody had assessed the microbial communities that are, that were in that region um, after the surfactant uh, dispersal oh, yeah. and, and uh, all of that. Yeah, so the Deepwater Horizon incident is a huge field experiment that's still ongoing. And certainly there was a lot of work looking at the microbial populations and how they change with the spill. And there's a, there's a lot of evidence that the right type of petroleum degrading microorganisms, those organisms, the population of those bloomed. Uh, but as soon as those, uh, those the concentration of hydrocarbons was reduced, the organisms have gone back. And I, I mean, I haven't looked at the most recent data, but I would be extremely surprised if the microbial communities, communities haven't gone back to the 
to the baseline uh, uh, populations. Uh, what was your total amount of surfactant used in the spill? At your 100 to 1 ratio, that's 50,000 barrels, I think. It what probably was it? wasn't anywhere near that because you weren't treating the whole time, is that right? Yeah, the, the numbers for subsea were something like 400,000 gallons, if I remember correctly. Gallon. Yeah, and there was, because they weren't treating the whole time. And they weren't actually using a 1 to 100 ratio all the time. For the, oil. the spill was quite complicated. The oil wasn't coming out of a single source. They were trying to treat one source more than a source that was closer to the wellhead because of simultaneous operations. Um, but that's a combination. I think it's 1.2 million gallons was the amount of oil this person that was used both subsea and at the surface. The yeah, second question is, what is the strategy as far as uh, uh, letting the oil come to the surface or getting a deep uh, bottom sea bloom? If you put the surfactant in at the bottom, it'll stay down there for the most part compared to if you don't. Right. What's the thinking behind that? Yeah. Choosing that option? Do you prefer to keep the plume at the bottom? Well, when the spill happened, you know, the, the consideration, at least broadly, for using that tool and putting, keeping the oil dispersed in the deep water um, hadn't been considered from a net environmental benefit analysis. But I will say there were 50 experts came together early in the spill to look at that option specifically. And these were experts, and a lot of them were experts who were very skeptical about the value of dispersants. They unanimously decided after two days of meeting and doing a, a net environmental benefit analysis in their meetings, they unanimously decided that the best thing to do was to apply dispersants at the wellhead and try to keep the dispersed oil in the deep water. And there's, you know, there's not a lot of information about these environments, but there are some fundamental information that I think most of us understand. But if you go to the Gulf of Mexico, the highest biodensity is going to be in the marsh areas and the nearshore areas. If you go out to 50 miles offshore, I don't know what the numbers would be, but I would estimate it's an order of magnitude lower biodensity in the pelagic zone go down into 1,500 meters of water, you probably reduce the biodensity by another order of magnitude. So that's the, sometimes that's the kind of information you have to have to make those kind of decisions. And I think just looking at the biodensity in 1,500 meters of water and the fact that there's not a lot of pathways between those communities and, and the surface organisms that are potentially of commercial value, those are the kind of things, think, the kind of thinking that went into the decision to use subsea dispersants. When but also, also oh, let me just mention, safety was another component. Yeah. And there was no one that could contradict the safety aspects when they saw those surface expressions. Okay, one third question is, where does the surfactant wind up? There are three places it could. It, if it's a surfactant, it'll be at the oil-water interface, or it'll partition into the water or into the oil, mostly. Yes. And uh, so what is the oil-water partition? Okay, so the, the, there are a suite of four different surfactants yeah, used in Corex, and they the all have a different HLB, right? And so they're designed that way. So some of them are going to leach out into the water. Some of them are going to remain into the oil, and some of them are going to stay right where they, where they need to stay at the interface. But ultimately, those, those compounds are all biodegradable, and I, would, I, would, I, I doubt that there is any trace of those surfactants in the Gulf of Mexico from that spill. Any, any longer, or maybe, maybe in just a few weeks after the spill was over. Well, if it goes into the water, there's a lot of water out there compared to the five million barrels of oil. Right? Yeah. Sometimes a dilution is the solution to pollution when you have an emergency. 